Today, we continue our series on untold heroes and little-known history. Our focus this episode is the military glider crash in St. Louis in August 1943. The tragedy derailed the American World War II military glider program before it was even getting off the ground. I'm Robert Child, and that's next. And this is Point of the Spear. Summer is a great time for catching up on military history, and my book about the seven Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II, Immortal Valor, has just been released in paperback. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes, life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you pick up the new paperback version, hardcover or audiobook, available in stores and online. The most tragic wartime aviation disaster midway through World War II did not occur overseas. It happened in the United States with a climatic twist in the story that is impossible to believe. It was a disaster that changed the trajectory of the fledgling U.S. Air Force and sent shivers down the spines of Americans assigned to fly in new motorless aircraft infamously dubbed Flying Coffins. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe to this podcast and let us know in the comments what other history topics you'd like to hear about. The Army's glider program was a new tool in the arsenal and the point of the spear for the American Airborne in World War II. It was launched as an answer to Germany's secret glider corps, which had an 18-year head start. Major General Henry Hap Arnold, known as the father of the United States Air Force, acquired a keen interest in the successes of the German glider corps. On February 25, 1941, he announced, In view of certain information received from abroad, a study should be initiated on developing a glider that could be towed by an aircraft. The winning design was developed by Waco Aircraft of Troy, Ohio, and approved by the military, and bids went out to manufacturing firms. One of those firms was Robertson Aircraft Corporation, based at the Lambert, St. Louis Flying Field near St. Louis, Missouri. The company had gained a reputation through their reliable airmail service throughout the Midwest and their most famous employee. Charles A. Lindbergh was chief pilot of the Robertson Aircraft Corporation. He flew a night airmail route between St. Louis and Chicago, utilizing a modified de Havilland DH-4B for the U.S. Postal Service through 1926. The following year, Lindbergh resigned from Robertson Aircraft and formed a group to finance and build the Spirit of St. Louis. He then embarked in that plane on his historic non-stop solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean, 20 the 21st of May, 1927. By 1942, Robertson, with decades of aviation service now behind them, eagerly jumped into the manufacturing process for the Waco Glider and secured a bid to build 170 CG-4As. However, it was a rocky start, with the company dogged by mismanagement and manufacturing delays. An outside report stated that the company was internally torn by jealousies and so hampered by incompetence by persons in positions of authority that it was disgraceful. By December 1942, Robertson had not delivered a single glider to the military. Major E.W. Dickman, the chief of the glider unit in the production division at Wright Field, Ohio, recommended that Robertson's contracts be canceled. On the 31st of December, 1942, the company was notified that its orders were being pulled. An appeal resulted in the termination notice being rescinded, and Robertson was offered a second chance. However, by the 17th of March, 1943, only six of a scheduled requirement of 23 gliders had been completed and accepted by the government. The contract was again on life support, and the company's involvement in the glider program was on the verge of being terminated. Under Secretary, Robert P. Patterson interceded on May 1, 1943, declaring that he thought it would be cheaper to continue all CG-4A contracts than to cancel those of the poor producers, which saved Robertson's contract. The company then redoubled efforts to satisfy its obligations, but the road would only get rockier. In the summer of 1943, St. Louis was experiencing an economic boom directly tied to the city's war effort. Two local aviation firms, Robertson and Leicester Kaufman, had been awarded contracts to build some of the nation's military glider fleet. 
a promotional idea was hatched to help sell war bonds while showcasing civic pride. A glider flight demonstration was planned for August 1st that would carry aloft the city's high-ranking officials for their very first ride in a military glider. The day dawned with sweltering temperatures and humidity in the 90s, but the thousands of airshow attendees remained undaunted and the streets leading to Lambert Field were jammed. Navigating through that traffic in a stretch black limousine was the popular cigar-chomping mayor, William Billy Becker and his wife Louise. Louise, pouting beside her husband, had been initially invited on the glider flight, but told at the last minute that having women on board was against military rules. Operationally, gliders were towed into flight by a C-47 cargo and transport plane, and the waiting crowd was treated to an initial demonstration flight without the dignitaries, which went off without a hitch. Mayor Becker finally arrived on the tarmac opposite the grandstands to a cheering crowd and an olive drab C-47 and Waco CG-4A. After a few short speeches and a push to buy war bonds, Mayor Becker boarded the glider with his fellow passengers. On board were St. Louis Deputy Controller Charles Cunningham, Director of Public Utilities Max Doyne, Army Air Force's Lieutenant Colonel Paul Hazelton, St. Louis Chamber of Commerce President Thomas Dysart, Robertson Aircraft President William Robertson, Robertson Aircraft Production Manager Harold Kruger, and St. Louis County Court Judge Henry Muller. On hand to capture all the action was St. Louis Cub photographer Jack Zert, whose soon-to-be chilling images would be printed by magazines and newspapers around the globe. Zert had earlier asked permission to bring his camera on board for the historic flight. Today, he remains undyingly grateful that the military turned down his request. The takeoff was flawless, and both the C-47 and Robertson glider smoothly took to the air, banked, then flew over the cheering, waving crowd. The plan was for the C-47 to tow the glider some distance from the airfield, release it, and then have it glide back and land at the airport. That plan unraveled almost immediately. A second or two after the tow rope was released from the C-47, the passengers inside heard a loud snap, and then the right wing sheared off and began fluttering to earth. Captain Milton Clue, the helpless pilot, could do nothing. The Robertson glider, filled with St. Louis dignitaries, turned and plunged nose first towards the tarmac. A horrified onlooker cried out, My God, they'll all be killed! And with that, the Robertson glider met the Earth at more than 80 miles per hour. The American public, which scarcely knew an American military glider program existed, was now greeted with nationally published photos revealing the terrible tragedy. Military officials who had supported the glider effort now had to contend with a public relations nightmare. With the American losses in Sicily less than a month earlier and Eisenhower's disinterest in fighting a war from the air, it had become the darkest of days for the American airborne. And for Hap Arnold's fledgling glider program, it was going to take no less than a miracle to get it back off the ground. Although sabotage was strongly suspected in St. Louis, an inquiry conducted by the Army Air Forces, the FBI, and both branches of Congress arrived at a different conclusion. A laboratory examination uncovered structural failure. The metal fitting that connected the wing strut to the fuselage had snapped. When engineers more closely examined the broken part, they determined that the metal had been bored to too great a depth leaving it considerably and dangerously thinner than the specifications required. And in a twist where the truth is stranger than fiction, the subcontractor responsible for the parts manufacture, Gardner Metal Products Company, had never designed fittings for an aircraft. More importantly and ironically, their business was the manufacture of coffins. The day prior to the glider flight, newspaper reporters had asked Mayor Becker about the possible safety hazards and if he was worried. He responded jokingly with a comment almost eerily prescient. Gentlemen, you can die only once, and we all must die sometime. After all, when our time comes to die, there isn't much we can do about it. That's all for today's episode of Untold Heroes and Little Known History. Thanks for joining me. Be with us next time as we explore more stories of unsung heroes and little known history. And don't forget to click that subscribe button so you'll be notified of future episodes. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.